I asked my my mom to come on the podcast because we were having an interesting conversation the other day when we were we were garage selling, um, where we started talking about um, enabling, and you know the other part that came up for me was entitlement, um, and then just right now when you were asking me, well I don't know anything about entitlement. What was it you said? You said I didn't think you were entitled, and I said, well, it's because you were an enabler, so you didn't you didn't recognize that. So, here's the definition of entitlement that we're going to work off of. So, the belief that one is inherently deserving of privileges or special treatment, and then enabling, um, giving something or someone the authority or means to do something. Um, yeah, and the other one's like a, a, a computer reference. So, you said you went to a training or something that came up and you felt like they were talking directly to I, you. I went to a conference. And at the conference, they had a speaker that was a psychologist. And she was talking about the book that she had written on different behaviors mm -hmm. and she was going through listing behaviors and one of them was an enabling behavior mm -hmm. and as she was describing behaviors and characteristics of an enabler I felt like she was looking directly at me and I was immediately started processing um, those behaviors and realized the damage that that behavior was doing to yeah. to you. And uh, I made a conscious effort to change that behavior. Mm. You didn't like it very much. No. You, uh, it's because I was entitled. <laughs> Is it starting to make sense now? <laughs> yeah, now it makes sense. <laughs> I didn't think I was entitled. <laughs> I had done that, but apparently that was the, the product that was being created. Yeah. And uh, I guess the first real change was um, created a, a trust for you for your education. And at that time, you were attending San Angelo. Yep. And uh, you were majoring in partying. Yeah, I was on vacation. Yeah, and uh, realized that that really wasn't acceptable. Yeah. So... Um, had your trust dissolved and you were very angry about that. Yeah. Because it was like, wait a minute, I thought you said my education was important and, <laughs> and of course you're trying to make me feel guilty <clears throat> and uh, I just said it is, but not when you're blowing it. Yeah. So if it's that important, you're going to have to figure it out on your own. Cause so, and to put it in context... I, I was in San Angelo for one year, right? and I took a, a full load each semester, so that was 12 hours, and I ended up... Just barely a full load? No, 12 hours is a, is a full... I know. It was a full, full load, and so I ended up leaving after a year with six hours of credit. Six or nine, I think. Probably six. Yeah, and I think one of them was... I don't remember. It was like gym or something like that. And then another one was maybe something in psychology. Maybe. Some of the stuff I was interested in. Any any yeah, any of the other stuff I did I didn't go. Right. Um, yeah. And you know, at at that time, you know, there was a lot of major transitions with our family and, and everything. Uh, my parents had gone through a divorce and you know, I was living independently for probably one of the first times and, you know, living in a dorm. And right. Yeah. I went nuts. I didn't know everything. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It, it, it was... Except for when I went to go visit after he had uh, joined a, a fraternity. Yeah. You yeah. took me to the fraternity house. Yeah, Remember that? Yep. That was a really good idea. Yeah. yeah. Remember de doing my first keg? Yeah, a keg stand. A keg stand. That's right. Yeah. This is how enabled he was, <laughs> that he convinced me to do a keg stand. Yeah. I couldn't believe. Never in my life had I done that, and now all of a sudden I was at San Angelo Fraternity Home. 
and all the guys thought that was pretty cool that he was able to talk me into doing that. And yeah. Wasn't very smart, but I did it. Yeah. I thought it was cool at the time. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So the, the pattern that you and I had created, right, was you, you would sweep in and, and rescue. Right. right. And that was pretty much my, my whole life. Right. So I was diagnosed with a learning disability at age seven. And, you know, my pattern with, with education was I wouldn't do anything all year. And then at the end of every school year, you know, I was like in a scramble to get everything done to be able to make it to the next grade. And so it was like you and me sitting at the kitchen table just trying to crank out as much work as possible. And then, you know, I remember college, you know, um, not being prepared for what real life was going to look like and going to college and turning in my first paper handwritten. And my professor, um, I don't remember what his name was, but I remember he's from Australia. And he looked at it and it was like, in his Australian accent, which I'm not going to try to do right now, was like, what the F is this? And I was like, uh, it's, it's my paper. And he's like, I can't read it. And I was like, well, yeah, but it's two and a half pages. That's what, you know, you had asked for. And he said, but it's handwritten. Like, why didn't you type it? And I told him, I don't know how to type. And he said, that's not my problem. And it was like, what do you, well, I have a learning disability. Let me throw that card out there, right? Because that had got me able to skate around everything for a long time. And he said, okay. He's like, you know, go to the resource office and, and they'll help you type. And it was like, well, I'll go home and get my mommy to do it. Which you did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then then the next paper came up, and he said, we're not going to do this anymore. He said, your, <clears throat> your papers are your responsibility, and you're going you're gonna to write them. So uh, I could already see then, you know, some changes that were happening, you know, and I didn't have any emotional resilience or, or any skills, and so I just gave up. I just quit. And then, you know, I was struggling pretty heavily with addiction back then. And so I just fell even even deeper into that. Um, you know, you, you didn't recognize that you were enabling, you know, those behaviors or creating entitlement with me. What did you think you were doing? I just thought I was being a mom. Okay. I thought I was, I guess, unconsciously, you know, when you were diagnosed with your learning disability. Mm. I think that kind of, we use that as a crutch yep. for everything, you know, and tried to, to make up things for you, not knowing that, you know, this was how it was affecting you. And then I think, too, back then we were so involved in, in a business that the, <clears throat> the time and, and all the, the things that it was taking uh, my time. I mean, I was going to work at seven in the morning, and sometimes didn't get home till eleven o'clock at night because mm -hmm. I was doing everything from marketing to payroll to um, that. You know, being a mom yeah. was not the priority. It was being or running a business, and at that time, thinking that's what we needed to do to to make a better life for you guys and yep. <clears throat> just the the family dynamics got turned upside down yeah and and there was also you know i was the last child right and so you know my my brother and my sister you could kind of put them into motion and tell them what to do and they would more often than not my, my sister especially would follow through with what she was being told to do my brother somewhat too mm -hmm. um and me you know if you put me in motion but you didn't check up on me, then I was off doing something else that I probably wasn't supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I know that that was a big um, change, you know, in parenting is that you had, a, you had a kid that was more challenging and needed a lot more attention probably back, especially back then. And, and we, I wasn't prepared for that. Yeah. Because, I mean, I, I grew up, you know, pretty self-motivated and did my homework and did all that kind of stuff and 
you know, Lee did the same thing in, you know, Bo, like you said, somewhat. Mm. But, I mean, he still did what he needed to do yeah. and, and things like that. And then all of a sudden, you know, you came along and, and uh, <clears throat> you know, we thought you were doing. You'd, you'd tell us, wait, yeah, did my homework, never followed up, took you at your word. Mm. You know, I never thought I would have a child that would actually tell me a lie. Wow. Um, that just didn't happen. Yeah. And uh, so... I mean, we didn't check up on you until they were, you know, threatening that you weren't going to pass. And then we were at the last minute doing what we needed to do and getting you through. And I started learning more about your disability when I started working as a consultant at the school district and spent time with the teachers and the administration and especially Miss. Miss Ori at the time, she was uh, a vice principal and she was over special education. Mm -hmm. Realized then the rights of a of a family that somebody in special ed. And, you know, as parents, you think the school is doing what's right for the child. Yeah. <laughs> and you trust them. <clears throat> it's a blind trust that you have in the educational system. Yep. And we had s picked the district that we were in because it was a better district. Mm -hmm. um, unbeknownst to us, you were being, because you were in special ed and, and the school wanted to be an exemplary school, you were being uh, put in a library when they were going through testing, through mm -hmm. the standardized testing, so that your scores wouldn't bring down the school scores. Yeah. And when that was explained to me, I was like, well, wait a minute. You know, this isn't right, because how are they measuring his education? So I started getting a little more involved in, in your education and and uh, learning that yeah. we had a voice. Started going to your ARD meetings and, and asking, what's the what's the lesson plan? How are you addressing his, his needs? Yeah. And there again, you were very upset. Well, because... I didn't get to go sit in the cafeteria and watch a movie. Exactly. I had to, I had to go do the testing. Which, exactly. You know, as a kid, I didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. As an adult, I still don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah. This was more in middle school when you, when I started getting more involved in your school and, and started learning more and, and started, I, I remember having the conversation with you that your education was your responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't mine and it wasn't your father's and it wasn't the teacher's at the end of the day it was yours yeah and that the only reason you were having to you know go to the core group was because you weren't doing your work well core core was self-containing classes mm -hmm. so in, in middle school i had lit a fire in the boys bathroom and you know they were talking about expulsion and and all these other things and then they decided to send me to core self-containing classes and so there was two different groups of of core there was one for kids with learning disabilities and then there was one that had kids that had more emotional disturbances and the one with learning disabilities was full and so i went to the one with with emotional disturbances and i remember thinking like i don't i don't think i belong here you know because yeah i acted up behaviorally and, and, you know, I got in a lot of trouble at school, but I didn't feel I was to the extent of some of the other kids that were in there. You know, I'm not saying like I was better or anything, but yeah, I, I saw stuff that, you know, I typically didn't see at home. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was a big eye opener, but then it was also really good for me because I recognized through my efforts, you know, I didn't want to be in there. You know, like I was going into eighth grade and I wanted to um, I wanted to play football and I wanted to go to regular classes. And so I was told I had to work my way out of it. And I did. And I had a, I had a really great teacher that was really supportive and taught me a lot of skills, you know, and supported me. And I put my head down. I just did my work. You know, that was the that was the first time I remember kind of grinding things out. And, and being motivated that I didn't want to be there. You know, where before, I don't, 
I know I don't really remember ever being motivated in school. I think this is the first time you were you were given challenges sure. that were exciting to you. And I remember they had set up a, a deal that if if you did X amount of work and you, you did this, you were going to be able to go to a ropes course yeah. with administrators and teachers and they were going to take certain students. Yep. And it was something that you really worked towards mm -hmm. and you ended up going to the ropes course. Yeah. And you were able to do things that even some of the adults couldn't do and you were really excited because you got to do those things. So I think that was one of the first times that you felt like, uh, yeah, I have a learning disability, but it can't keep me from doing other stuff. Mm -hmm. And you felt very proud about yourself because you, were, you weren't a very big person. You were mm -hmm. kind of small. Yeah. And that always bothered you. It was like, you know, I wanted to be big and, and strong and so you kind of had that little attitude about, you know, you you kind of were quiet. You wouldn't, and this is the first time you stood out. Yep. And it really motivated you, and you were really proud, and people were complimenting you, and you had a lot of success. Yeah. And and that that was really encouraging for you. I think that was probably the first time in the educational system that you felt like you could do stuff. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and then, you know, un unfortunately, it, it, you know, like anything, if you don't continue to feed it, then, you know, it dies out. And, you know, eighth grade, you know, I was back in regular classes. I played football. And then, you know, some of the old patterns started to come up. I, I don't think I was behaviorally acting out as much as I was before in the past. Because I didn't, I knew the consequences to things. Right. Um, but I still, you know, didn't didn't go on the straight and the narrow. And then high school, right, was kind of a joke. Um, you know, I took math of money for four years because, you know, they basically they just prepared me to work a cash register. Yeah. It it going into high school was kind of interesting because the the system again again. They they um, they wanted to label you emotionally disturbed so you could automatically get into special ed in high school. Mm. And I said, no. You know, if he's not ED, yeah. why do we want to label him just so he can automatically go to special ed? You know, if he is no longer learning disabled then he can just go to regular classes and, and we need to be pushing that envelope. Yeah. And so they said, you know, you have to be tested again to see if you still qualified. And I said, you know, we, we need to do what we need to do. And uh, he said, well, you're taking the risk that if he's tested and, you know, he's not LD, then he's going to go to regular classes. And I just, I remember looking at the administrator and saying, well, hasn't that been our goal? Yeah is for him to to go to to be at his potential and she just kind of looked at me and anyway they tested you again and of course i mean you have a learning disability yep. and that's something that you don't outgrow no I you don't. learn to deal with it yeah and Hopefully. you learn to learn i mean i think we i remember the light bulb kind of going off at, at some point you said you know Learning disability doesn't mean that I can't learn. It just means that I have to learn in a different way. Yeah. And I was like, wow, isn't this true? No. Yeah. But it But it still wasn't enough to keep you I think you just took the easy way out. Well, that was yeah, that's what I was gonna yeah. say is is the reality was is I was lazy. You know, yeah. and, and if something took more effort um to do at that time in my life, like I wasn't interested. You know, because I, I could take the easy route. Mm -hmm. I could say, you know, oh, I can't do it. And somebody else would step in and do it for and do me. Do it for you. Yeah. And that that goes back to that enabling. Right. right? Like, you know, if I, if I just acted helpless long enough, you know. And that's a, <clears throat> you know, when I went to work at the therapeutic boarding school, 
and I started doing a lot of family dynamic work. Um, you know, I, I got to see a lot of these things play out, you know, because you would see this very commonly with families. <coughs> um, you know, what they taught us is what's called the drama triangle. And so you had the persecutor, you had the, uh, the rescuer, and then you had the victim. And they would all, the victim would always play the other ones against each other, right? So, like, they're not getting what it is that they want, right? Well, they don't go to the persecutor because that person's going to, like, obviously persecute them. So they go to the, to the rescuer, and the rescuer always sweeps in and helps them in some way. The problem is, is that the rescuer thinks that they're doing a good job of helping them. What they don't recognize is that message underneath that is, you're not good enough to do it on your own, right? Let me do it for you, right? So that way, you know, you, you, you don't have to fail, right? Or you don't have to feel discomfort. And that's the thing that I think a lot of families are missing, right? Is that if the persecutor takes charge, right? The message is once again, you know, you're you're not good enough to do it on your own. Let me tell you what to do, right? So then you have a kid that either is afraid of making decisions and becomes an extreme follower, right, which allows them to fall into other things, or you have a kid, you know, that rebels against that, right, and pushes back really hard and and rejects anything that looks like authority, right? And then you know how those dynamics all play against each other. Right. And that's the difference between being supportive of somebody. Right. Versus enabling them. Right. Support should look like, you know, you're alongside that person. Right. And, and you're helping them, you know, get to where they need to be. Right. It's not, you know, dragging them, kicking and screaming. And it's not, you know, well, let me carry you across the finish line so that way you can get there. Right. And that's that's what I saw a lot of families very often they couldn't tolerate the victim's discomfort and so they couldn't get off of this loop right like the rescuer would just you know well you know i I can't let them fail right like what's going to happen what are going to be the consequences you know it, it was just too emotionally painful to see this person go through this and then you know they would just fall back into those those loops and those patterns Right. And I hated to see that for those families because, you know, me being in my, I think it was late thirties by then, I knew what that was going to potentially mean. Right. Didn't, didn't mean, you know, the correlation, mean exact causation, but I felt like I knew the path that they were going to be potentially heading on and I didn't want that for them. Oh, no, cause you just described our family setup. Yeah. Yeah. And unbeknownst to us, I mean, sure. now that you've described it, I can clearly see it. Yeah. You know, that, that is the loop that we were in. Yeah. And, and you know, how, how you get off of that loop is the two parents have to work as a unified front, right? You know, because it was easy in our household is, is we could bug you until we could potentially get what it was that we wanted. If you were really firm about something, you'd say, go ask your dad. And then it was like, eh, I don't want it that bad. Right? Mm-hmm. Because we knew most of the time it was going to be met with a no or a really in-depth explanation as far as like why you want to do it and then we wouldn't be able to get get away or do whatever it was that we wanted so we just avoided it and so a lot of that fell pretty heavily on you but it also created this dynamic or dichotomy that we fell or or found ourselves in um you know the, the biggest thing is these patterns can these patterns can be broken right right and so you know let's let's talk about you know how you broke that pattern one You recognized it was a thing, right? Right. Like, you became educated that, oh, okay, I'm enabling, right? Like, I'm not helping, you know, Sean get to where he needs to be, right? What were some of the steps that you took, and what did did you do? I just, first of all, when I recognized that this is what I was doing, my biggest fear was I had a relative, and I had an aunt, who clearly was an enabler Mm. and she had a son and I saw the path that he went down. I mean, and he was a very likable person and everybody talks about him today and you know, we all laugh and 
about the shenanigans that he did and and those kinds of things, but they were such negative behaviors. I yeah. mean, to the point to where he ended up in prison because he broke into a, a bar, you know, just to drink and ran away and got shot and they amputated his leg and just, you know, he just thought it was a big joke. Yeah. And my aunt totally bailed him out over and over. And as she was describing these behaviors, I saw that relationship and I saw that fear because yeah. I saw that you were a lot like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you gave us the look and you kind of smiled and your heart melted and you got away with stuff. Yep. And you charm people that way. You were very likable mm -hmm. and still are. I mean, but it, you were using those positive things for negative outcomes. Yep. And I saw that. And that was my biggest fear is that you were going to end up down that road. Which I would have. You would have. And I said, no, Lord. I mean, I, I prayed a lot. I, uh, I asked God to give me the strength to be the mother that I was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And just started saying no. Yeah. This is really what I started doing. You know, the first no was really that dissolving the trust you're not going back to school you're not going back to school not on my money or, or the trust that we had set up for yep. you and again you know met with that a lot of anger and uh i just started learning to say no practicing tough love then is and really what i started doing my tools of negotiation weren't working because there wasn't anything substantial to support it right like me saying well let me go back to school because you know, like, I, I really value my education. None of that was true. Oh. You know, I just wanted to go back so I could see my friends and mm -hmm. drink and party and stuff. And, you know, I, I remember being pushed back on with those things, and I was kind of like, well, this is weird, right? Like, I'm not getting what it is that I want, right? And so um, <clears throat> I remember, yeah, you said, okay, I'm going to move to California. You know, you can move back to San Antonio. If you want, you can rent the house, right? You need to pay the, the bills, right? The bills are the electricity, the water. All the utilities. All the utilities. Yeah. All the utilities. Um, and if you want to get roommates, you can get roommates, and they can help you with it. But, you know, like, you're basically you're on your own. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, like, okay, well, this is cool. You know, I've got a house. And then I remember pretty quickly the bills starting to add up and you being like i'm not I'm not paying these things right like right. you need to pay them and so i started scrambling around with odd jobs and you know making enough money to kind of barely get by you know that kind of stuff and then um landing a full-time job and then liking what i was doing and then paying bills and then feeling that sense of accomplishment that like okay like i can life Right. Like that was that was the big thing that I was afraid of is that, you know, I felt like I was going to fail at everything. And the fear of failure was so strong that it prevented me from doing things. You know, it was like it was easier for me to just stay frozen versus like attempting something and not being good at it or failing or or. Yeah, I'll we'll just go with that. Um, and. Yeah. Feeling that sense of accomplishment for the first time. Accountability. You know, accountability for my actions. If I don't go to work, well, then I don't have money for food and bills and, and you know, the other stuff that I wanted. And that was the first time that I kind of really remember feeling that. Well, I think you finally, you know, 2006, you, that's when I moved to California to go work in California. Mm -hmm. And your sister was living in California also. So yeah. for the first time, I mean, our family was totally split wow. in different directions. So we were all in our own space. Yep. And you found yourself there where, you know, nobody could bail you out. The, yeah. the two people that normally <coughs> bailed you out were gone. Yep. And so you had to do things for your own. And, and I think you s kind of started saying that, that. You know, if I call, you know, then you saw that, and then I failed because I have to reach out to them. So, I mean, 
you struggled, but you never turned to us. You never made the phone calls that say, hey, I need help. So, and we didn't, we didn't offer it. Yeah. Well, so you figured it out on your own. I had, yeah. And I felt like I had to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, there was a lot of things coming up on that time. And, you know, I was, I was already in a contemplative state in regards to my drinking being out of control, you know. I wasn't I wasn't in a place where I was really ready to stop. You know, it's it's interesting because I I've, I've been sober now for 10 years. Um you know, but from from when I OD'd and I and I was hospitalized to when I actually gave it up there was what 15 years. So yeah. I was so I was 19. No, I was 20. It this was in what? 19 99 99 98 something like that yeah yeah and then yeah like there was there was times that it kind of ebbed and flowed there was times where it was kind of better you know like my my whole thing was i was saying things like well i'm not drinking all day every day mm-hmm. right and then i went into well you know I'm, I'm maintaining a job a little bit you know and then i went into you know i remember when it was really bad that i was thinking like I need to find a job to where I can drink and work at the same time because I don't think I can not drink. Um, <clears throat> and then realizing that wasn't really a reality. Um, and then, yeah, eventually finally giving it up, you know, because that relationship was no longer serving mm-hmm. me a purpose. But, yeah, you you dialing back... You know, like, I always knew that, like, I had your support. You know, I knew if if something was really big and I needed your help, like, I felt the sense that, like, you would be there for me. But I had developed pride to where I didn't want to have to depend on you anymore. Right. You know, and and I started thinking about what life was going to look like you know, growing up and, and not being a man child anymore, you know, and, and, you know, that's helped me progress into the life that I have now. And I, and I think too, and I thought about this many times, I think the, the divorce, um, kind of put you in a situation to where you became more of my defender. Mm -hmm. Like you felt like you had a responsibility to take care of your mother. Mm-hmm. And I had to be the man of the house. Yeah. And I mean, it wasn't something that I asked of you. Yeah. I just saw that behavior there that, and I think that kind of caused you to change and caused you to grow up because it was like, okay, I'm not really acting like a man. Yeah. So how can I take care of my mother? And that was something that was very important to you. And, I, I, I kind of saw that attitude of, of you, you know, wanting to be my defender, wanting to be my protector. Well, then, and that's a, that's a quality of, of good men is that they should be protective, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, and, and I was protective of my family, you know, my, my dad had always been that person for our family, had been, you know, the person that protected us. We felt safe. We felt secure. You know, and, and then when the divorce happened and he wasn't part of that anymore, I, f- I felt like I had to fall into that role. I, you know, I had to look out for you and my sister and make sure that you guys are safe. And, you know, I did feel that, that strong sense of, of protection for you guys. And and at, at first <clears throat> it was an angry protection. You were at first, I mean, and just looking back at, at, at the changes, it came from being angry and your protection was almost like looking for a fight. Yeah. Like, I wanted to fight. Everything. Yeah. You, you wanted to fight everything. And that was a scary, a, a scary, uh, part. And then I, I, I do remember us even having conversations about that, that, you know, that's not what I was looking for. Right. And, you know, it was more of a, I think you eventually evolved to a, a healthy, mm-hmm protection and and, but it I think it had to do with your own growth your own personal growth of of where you needed to be or where you wanted to be and I think throughout those years I mean we've had some very healthy adult conversations and 
I think through your your education and and a lot of what I learned through my own education and and my own therapy that I went through and and uh, also the work I was involved with I and mean, I was involved in with a company where I learned a lot about behaviors yeah. and it was focused more on behaviors in the workplace but at the same time uh, those you know can be behaviors in general sure you know and then I went through a ministry in the workplace where I was certified to be you know to have ministry in the workplace in the company so I realized you know what ministry was about mm. So learning those kinds of things, I applied a lot of that behavior, you know, and how I dealt with my children as adults mm -hmm. and what was my ministry really all about. So that, when you ask me what changes did I make, I mean, I made a lot of conscious changes and then I think just, you know, made behavior changes within myself that you guys saw. Yeah. That, you know, mom, I mean... You saw me as a strong woman that went through all these changes, and yet I was having a better life, and mm -hmm. I was, you know, I was growing. Yeah. And, you know, I think that relationship that we have. I think the, the you also went through your rebellious teenager phase where <laughs> you were smoking cigarettes and <laughs> staying out late at night and... You know, I felt like I had switched to that parenting role of, like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Like, this makes no sense. Mm -hmm. Like, why are you doing something that potentially is harmful and, and all of that? And, and yeah. Um, I had forgotten about that stage. Yeah. Like, probably not something I talk about in public. <laughs> well, <laughs> not anything that uh, I forgot it's about. It's just I didn't talk about it in yeah, public. It I, was a, I became a closet smoker. No, why, no. I don't know, but I did. Yeah. And I think I think for you it was probably something that you could control, right? Right, and so, um, yeah, I think that's probably what allowed you to fall into that. But yeah, and I remember th being concerned, like, okay, so what does this mean? Are you going to make a bunch of drastic changes? And you know, but yeah, I mean, you know, it all ended up working out for the. You were time. concerned, but you were more empathetic about it. Sure. Whereas your sister was just like having fits and. You know, she was going to lose her mother to, to cancer now because she's smoking. And, sure. You know, I remember her and I going to therapy about that. And she wanted to be the parent and tell me what to do. And I was saying no. And we worked through all that. Well, I mean, like you said, we had a lot of growing pains and yeah. changes and learning to, to see what our new family dynamic was. Yeah. Which we've learned and we've grown from yeah which is very positive for all of us now yeah which i, th I think you <clears throat> know our relationship and family dynamic a dynamic is healthier than it's probably ever been right you know because of i see the individual work that we have all done and continue to try to do and change patterns that didn't work you know and and when stuff comes up now you know that like needs to be addressed um, I don't feel like it's ignored, you know, I feel like most of the time we're, we're talking about stuff like, Hey, I don't think you handled this situation right. And you know, what, what I've noticed and the work that I've done is that when there's a relational connection and approach, most of the time people are open to some type of feedback or criticism or constructive criticism, right? It's, it's people get defensive when they feel like they have to protect themselves. Right. And, and, you know, I have to realize that because my first natural uh, reaction is defensiveness. And I have to realize, like, okay, is this something that I need to hear and receive? Or is this something, you know, that I do have to protect myself against? You know, and I don't always have to justify reasonings and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> there was something that came up in our conversation also I thought was interesting. You said, and, I, and we'll have to verify to make sure that when I ended up going back to school, you know, that I cranked out the schooling pretty quickly. You did. I think when you, when you finally decided, I mean, of course, you know, you, this was like 2003 when pulled the, 
the trust and yeah. said, you're, you're going to go on your own. And you, you worked and yeah. you did stuff. And, and you ended up coming to work at the job site that, that I had. And, yep. and uh, we ended up going through a, a massive layoff yep. in January of 2009. And so you received your ROF along with 550 people. And, and that was a big change. Um, and I ended up going to Waco to work in Waco and and you were left back in San Antonio and I remember you were already taking some classes but I and decided you were going to go to work and you were but you were taking like six hours or something because you were working you yeah. were working and taking some classes my, so my classes I remember we talked about that and now you were going to get unemployment and and I remember us having the conversation that, you know, now's your opportunity to just focus on school yeah. and let that be your job and take more hours. And you ended up in, in 2009 getting an associate's. You had, you had enough hours between everything that you had that you were able to get an associate's in yeah. psychology and and it was almost like the light bulb went off. Yeah. And went you were the... like, hey, I can really do this. Yeah. So between 2009 and May of 2012, yeah. you ended up with your associates, your bachelor's, and your master's. Yeah. And you made the dean's list several semesters. Yeah. I, f I found those plaques recently. Yes. And it was like, in three <coughs> years, you got three degrees. Yeah. And you were and I remember thinking when you in May of 2012 it was like wow, you know, he did it in 3 years he got but you buckled down and you really you you loved school. Yeah. Well, yeah, I liked learning about stuff that I was interested in. The stuff that I didn't want to do was like pulling teeth. Right. Um but you know, the stuff that I enjoyed and I was starting to get into more of the classes that I liked. But, you know, it's still, yeah, it's still interesting to reflect on, you know, that path. Because I, I remember being at school and telling myself, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to devote my time and my attention to schooling like, I, like as if I was training for a fight. Right. And, you know, like I was putting in, you know, eight-hour days. You know, and then sometimes late at night, you know, and when I was working construction, you know, I was up at 530 and then at the job site and then I could leave. I think I was able to leave at maybe 430 to try to get there to class on time. And then I was in class until nine o'clock and then I would go to the library and I would study until midnight and then go home and then, you know, I was home by one thirty or so. And then up again by five five thirty to go to mm. to go to work the next day, and you know I I remember you know at the time you know it was it was it was a hard grind, but I remember being very motivated because I didn't I didn't want to be outside sweating and like you know taking care of people's grass when I was sixty or seventy. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that for myself. I didn't want that. Right. You know, I I had been doing and I'd been doing manual labor work since I was 14, 15. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just had this epiphany where I was just like, you know, when I'm 60 or 70, I I don't want to be abusing my body and and not able to do this. Um so I just decided to abuse my body in lots of other different ways. And and you, I mean, your father and I helped you. Mhm. Mm in in getting you know, your education yeah. you know um i mean i provided a home for you cuz you were at the bay house yep. and you got to stay there and which was you, which was great cuz you know when i was living at the bay house for graduate school you know i was able to fish and i was able to hunt right you know the first semester of of graduate school you know me and my brother went out and we killed like six or seven hogs one night and so I lived off of hog meat, lived, mm -hmm. lived off of hog meat and fish for like about the first year. I'm still pretty burned out on Trader Joe's curry sauces <laughs> with Walmart vegetables and hog meat. That's not one of my favorite meals now. Yeah. 
But I ate that. I ate that a lot. And then, um, yeah, I remember working at the school, grading papers, and I was making like a hundred bucks a week, and it would cost me seventy five dollars a week to get to school, and then I had twenty five dollars a week for groceries and um, extracurricular activities. And so I would have to make the choice of either going to the bar or eating. And then, yeah. And and we we saw those behaviors, at least I saw those behaviors changing. Yeah. So, I mean, we didn't, you know, when you talked about you only had $25, I never knew those things because yeah. you didn't share that with us. No. All I saw is that you were taking care of your business. You were taking care of your education. You were making the dean's list. You were surviving. You weren't asking for anything. Yeah. So, I mean, the the enabling behavior changed because, yeah, I was still supportive. I became more of a support system, not the enabler. Yeah. I supported you because I, I had a home anyway down there, so you got to stay there. Yeah. Which you thought you died and went to heaven because you love being down there anyway. Absolutely. So that worked out for both of us, um, you know, and, and when you were in San Antonio, I still had the home in San Antonio until 2010, and then by that time you were working on your on your master's at, at uh, the Bay House, so it all worked out. Yeah, I mean, and but it allowed me to grow. Exactly. You know, I think was the big thing is like, you know, I didn't want to feel that, that feeling. It didn't, it didn't feel good. Right. It didn't feel good to have things handed to you, you know, and to not work for them. You know, people don't appreciate that. Right. And and I think that's where that strong sense of entitlement comes from is because if you don't earn something like you don't care about it. Right. Like, you know, I, I, I think that was the last thing I read about the participation medals. Right. Is that it's not it's not necessarily a good thing for for kiddos because it doesn't give them the feeling of accomplishment. Right. You know, it's like, oh, we're, we're, I don't have to do anything. I can just get this, right, without having to put any effort into it. You know, and, and that's that fear of letting people feel like they have failed, right? And, and the reality is that's what motivates us, right? Like, you know, I, I, that became like probably my best friend when I went back to school was feeling this sense of motivation and I think I've carried it over into other things in my life now you know when it comes to exercise and you know like when I did the MMA fight when I've done you know the half marathons the marathon the Spartan races all that kind of stuff is like there's this fear of failing that makes you get up to want to do the things you don't want to do Right. And so, you know, that creates a different sense of accountability. And when I'm talking about fear, it wasn't a different, it was a different type of fear. Right. Like, it wasn't like the enabling fear that I felt before of like, I'm terrified of failing. It was, I know what it feels like to be unmotivated, to be an alcoholic, to not love yourself and be in a place where you want to die. And I don't ever want to be back in that place again. And so because of it, I, I do the things I need to do and I do the work that I need to do to make sure that I don't ever become that person again. You know, it's easy to relapse back in old behaviors, right? And so, you know, as, as somebody that has struggled with addiction, you know, a big part of the addiction is being selfish. You know, like... It's all about you and you getting your needs met, you know, and I think that was that underlining theme with a lot of those things, you know, was that enabling behavior created the entitlement to where I felt like I deserve these things because, you know, stuff, it can be hard for me, right? But that didn't, it didn't, it didn't work out so well for a lot of years, you mm -hmm. know, and unfortunately... Yeah, you know, for some people, they don't ever get out of it. And I and I think, you know, for me, recognizing, you know, those negative enabling yeah. behaviors, learning to become more of a support, yep. supportive parent versus an enabling mother was 
my own personal growth also too, you know, and, and as a parent, I mean, if, if your heart's not in the right place and if you're not doing things for the, for the right reasons, I mean, it's going to affect your children, yeah. whether they're children or adults. I mean, you, so we were all making changes, yeah. you know, and, and I became, I became stronger. I became recognizing the, okay, the, you know, the role, what God wanted me to be as, as a woman, you know, my, my mantra kind of became, you know, Lord, you know, help me be, make me the woman I'm supposed to be, you know, the, who, who you created me to be and learning that. I mean, I remember there's a, there's a book that I encourage other women to do and, and it says fight like a girl. Mm. I remember being in in California and I went to a training and I woke up to the T V being on. I'd left it on and it was on the Bible network and she was talking about her book and I thought, Wow, you know, this sounds like something I need to go and I went I was in Denver at the time and, and I went to the bookstore and it was the last copy and I got it and it really helped me because it's all the women in, in the Bible and their different personalities and the re- reasons that they're strong. And and uh, it, it just kind of made me think more of, okay, you know, this is, these are the characteristics I want to have as a woman. Mm-hmm. And, you know, fight like a girl is not a negative thing. It's really, these are the strengths God gave women. Mm-hmm. And focusing more on that and being in situations where I'll ask God, you know, give me the words I'm supposed to say, the behaviors I'm supposed to demonstrate, because I'm living for you. And so constantly being focused on that kept me on that path. And I think the residuals are seeing where you and Lee are today yeah. as individuals, seeing you baptized yesterday. Yeah was like wow you know seeing where your life is today i mean that's answered prayer for me yeah but i also know that it's god's work and recognizing that really the role i have as a mother is to raise you encourage you to be in his image knowing that the choice is still yours it's not mine coming to that point to where we each recognize that he's the one that we're going to account to at the end and he's going to say you know what did you do Jenny Uh not telling me well it was okay you were an enabler with Sean you were you did it because you love him Uh no I mean he doesn't enable me he gives me a choice yeah he says if you do this this is what happens if you do this this is what happens choice is yours yep and coming to those terms, t- recognizing that I had to do the same thing with Sean. If you do this, this is what happens. If you do this, this is what happens. Choice is yours, Sean. Yeah. And I became more of that type of parent. Yeah, which I, you know, our our good friend Doug, um, he always talks about choose your heart, right? And this is what what he tells his kids all the time, right? Like. You know, making this decision is going to be hard, right? But but doing the right thing, you know, is going to be hard also, right? Which one do you want to do in the end, right? Choose choose your heart. And <clears throat> that's something that's definitely resonated with me a lot. So, all right. I'm kind of closing this up. If you had to give a message to parents out there that are struggling with this dynamic... Right. What what would you tell them? Probably what you just said, you know, what Doug says, you know, the they have to recognize that there's two roads. You know, if if you choose this, I think a parent needs to let their child know, if you do this, this is the consequence of this behavior. Yep. And if you do this, this is the consequence of that behavior. Yeah choice is yours you have to let a child you have to let them make choices yeah 
but I think we have a responsibility to make them aware of what those choices can have mm -hmm. and let them know what the consequence is, whether it's a good or bad consequence. This is because all life is about choices mm -hmm. and you're going to have these paths that you get to. You're going to have these intersections and you have to choose. So you have to decide. But we have that responsibility to help them recognize what those choices are and stay. And we have to be firm and engaged and be aware, yeah. which is probably the hardest because we've got so many things on our plate. But I think as a parent, we have to recognize that parenting is our number one priority mm. until that child can be on their own. Yeah. And they're never on their own. I mean, my parents are 90 and 93, and they still check on me. <laughs> still, still so they're still parenting. Yeah, still telling you what to do. <laughs> exactly. So how do you know if you are being supportive or if you are enabling? What's, how, do, how, do you, how does it feel different for you? Because the behavior is more positive. Okay. Um, I think you feel better. I mean, I see more positive results knowing that I'm supportive. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think you would be where you are today if I hadn't continued to enable no. you. No. I think we'd be seeing a lot more. So I, I think that's what, when you know that you're being supportive and not being an enabler. Yeah. I think in being an enabler, you're, it's just the easy way out. Yep. It's just the easy way out. But at the end, you start feeling a little more resentful. Don't feel as good about yourself because you're seeing these negative behaviors still. Yeah. When you're being supportive, you see a lot more positive behaviors with, with your child. And and I think you've you've got to give it some time because there's going to be a regression and there's going to be um, a pushback because that person's no longer getting what they want. That that change in the dynamic, right, disrupts the system, and that system that has enabled that person to be the way that they are for so long. You know, they've got to feel the discomfort to recognize, you know, this is no longer serving me a purpose and I've got to do something different. Right. So y you have to be in a place to where you can you basically ride out that storm, hmm. you know, and, and yeah, I mean, when I, when I was able to recognize that uh, this isn't serving me a purpose any longer, you know, I had the opportunity for change. You know, and sometimes we get forced in those those situations. But that was the best thing for me. You know, I, I feel, any, you know, I never know the future about things, but I feel like it would have taken me a lot longer to become independent and um, grow up had those things not happened. You know, could it have happened? Sure. I mean, but... I mean, it, it really did. It all fell into place the way that I, I, you know, feel like it should have been. I think I think our faith brings us, we, we come to recognize that God's in charge. Mm -hmm. He knows what the outcome is. He knew where we were headed. And sometimes we went through things that were very tough. But knowing that He's got us at the end is what made us strong or made me strong. Yeah. I, I, mean, I heard this. Sorry to cut you off. I'm, I'm going to cut you off. <laughs> <laughs> I, heard, I heard this interesting analogy the other day that being a parent now made a lot of sense to me. You know, is that people feel like, okay, well, if, if God is an all-knowing, all-powerful God, Right, like, why does bad stuff happen to the world? Why does he allow bad stuff to happen to good people? You know, like, why don't you get everything that you want? Those types of things. And <clears throat> yeah, I'm paraphrasing because I heard another person talking about it, so I'm not I'm not saying this is my own original thought, um, but it put things into perspective for me. 
is is he said you know um i i took my he said he took his young son to the grocery store and he had exactly enough money in his pocket to be able to like get some get some groceries and then also pay their mortgage he said and and the kid was just like you know i want this i want this i want this and he kept telling him no you know we can't we can't you know have everything that we want you know we have to have exactly this because i only have this much money in my pocket you know i've got to pay the mortgage and we've got to we only have this much for groceries and he said you know this kid's like five or six years old and so conceptually he has no idea what a mortgage is right and so he's like you know well i'm not getting my needs met and so the kid's getting upset and angry and frustrated and resentful and you know give me what i want I want the candy, I want this, I want, you know, whatever it was he was fighting for. And he just kept trying to explain to him, you know, no, I can't do this. And I can't give you everything that you want, you know, that I, I love you, right? But I just can't give you everything that you want. And, you know, he started thinking about it as this is this is the relationship with God. You know, that like, as humans we're not always to conceptually we're not a- always able to conceptually understand an infinite beings purpose and meaning and reactions to things right and much like that child kicking and screaming cuz i'm not getting my needs met is is what i feel like a lot of us do when we're in that place right and that we become angry and resentful and we want to blame you know whatever it is that this isn't working out the way that I wanted it to, you know, and, and what I have taken away from, you know, my experiences and even, even the really bad stuff that's happened in my life is that it's all pointed me in this direction, you know, and it has made me the person that I am now. And I wouldn't exchange any of the trials and tribulations for that because I'm, I'm, I'm where I need to be. And I am who I am because of that, right? But did it, was it bad at the time? Sure, right? But I learned how to be emotionally resilient and I learned how to be able to like look for the meaning of things versus being angry and resentful and feeling like a victim that this stuff is happening to me, you know? And so hearing that made a lot of sense because, you know, I've got a, I've got a two-year-old now that... You know, when she wants something, she really wants it, Mm -hmm. you know, and I have to explain to her, you know, you can't have bananas all day long, you know, and I'm not going to give you bananas all day long. I love you, you know, and I know that you want a banana, but, you know, we need to have protein. We need to have this, you know, and she conceptually doesn't understand it. Of course She just wants to get her needs met, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and us as human beings, you know, it put it into perspective that we're very much the same the way. You know, and, and so, you know, I've, I've learned to be more um, open to when things are bad. What is this trying to teach me versus why is this happening to me? You know, that's been my, my mantra now for probably, I don't know, a decade. Well, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to just give in. Sure. It's the, the path of least, least resistance. <laughs> yeah. And that's hard. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's why I said parenting is, is, I think we should all have a child psychology class as, I agree. as parents. I think we should be required to, to do those things because we don't know everything. There's a, the, a great line from that movie, Parenthood, where he says, you know, you have to have a license to catch a fish. You have to have a license to drive a car. He said, but any moron can have a kid. And, you know, I remember hearing that as a little kid and, and thinking, well, that makes sense. You know, and, and I, I think now at the hospitals when you have a kid, you know, they have you watch some videos and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Some of it's helpful. But I, I do think, you know, if, if, if you are going to have a kid, right, take the time to learn about probably developmental psychology, um, you know, and maybe just an intro to psychology. I I I think there's two I think the the child development you know from just the world mm. but spiritual development sure. as a parent 
Yeah. That's why the Bible says, bring up a child in the ways of the Lord. And even though he might stray, he will always come back. <laughs> very true. And very true. That's where I always remember that. Yeah. And that was as a, as a mom, that's where I wanted to, to focus and try to do my, yeah. my best. Yeah. Well, so I love you. I love you too appreciate everything you've you've done for me and i you know appreciate the support that i have felt for you my entire life you know you have taught me and truly exemplified what unconditional love really is and you know it has helped me you know become a healthier individual and now be in a place where i'm able to to help other people um you know, there's a reason why I wanted you to come on here so you and I can have this discussion and people could see, you know, the importance of it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, thank you. You're welcome. I love you. <laughs> love you Te too. quiero mucho. <laughs>